And I'd now like to turn it over to Mike Morheim to update you on what's going on at Blizzard. Thank you, Eric. Since the last call, we launched Cataclysm in China and made some exciting announcements on both StarCraft II and Diablo III. I'll go into greater detail about those in a moment. First, I'd like to talk briefly about the financial side of the business. For the first half of 2011, Blizzard is up year over year in net revenue as we've added Cataclysm and StarCraft II to our product mix and have brought value-added services live in China. In addition, we have increased our investments in service and product development in order to better serve our community and strengthen our business for the long term. Moving on to StarCraft II, back in May, we invited press from around the globe to get a first look at the upcoming expansion pack, Heart of the Swarm. We showcased a couple of levels from the game's campaign, and we have seen a lot of positive feedback and coverage about this sneak peek. We look forward to sharing more information and news about Heart of the Swarm at the upcoming Gamescom later this month, as well as at BlizzCon in October. We also just released the Starter Edition of StarCraft II this week. The Starter Edition lets players play through a portion of the single-player campaign, and they can also play unlimited multiplayer battles as the Terran race on a few different maps for free. Our hope is that the Starter Edition will encourage more gamers to try out StarCraft II, and they'll eventually upgrade to the full edition. On the World of Warcraft side, we experienced a slight, a slight decrease in subscribership during Q2, closing the quarter at 11.1 million subscribers worldwide. Since that time, we launched Cataclysm in China and have seen an increase in concurrency within the region. We're very excited to have delivered the latest expansion to Chinese players, and we look forward to working with our local partner, NetEase, to continue improving the rate at which we are able to release new content to our players there. In addition to the China launch, we also just announced that we will be releasing a Portuguese version of World of Warcraft in Brazil later this year. Aside from promoting World of Warcraft in other regions, we're taking other steps to bring more players into the community. With the new World of Warcraft Starter Edition, players are now able to play the game for free until level 20 with no time restrictions. Since the launch of this program, we've seen a significant increase in new account creations, which we hope will allow us to continue attracting new players. The World of Warcraft development team is also working on the next content update, which will include, <clears throat> excuse me, which will include major new raid and dungeon content. We believe that this new endgame content will keep the game fresh for current players and provide compelling reasons for lapsed players to come back. Before moving on to Diablo 3, I want to thank our World of Warcraft community for their warm response to our recent charity pet, the Scenarian Hashling. We pledged that Blizzard would donate 100% of the proceeds from sales of this pet through July 31st to help Japan relief efforts. Through this initiative and the generosity of our players, Blizzard will donate more than $1.9 million to support ongoing earthquake and tsunami relief in Japan. Many of you are already aware of the big news that we recently shared about Diablo 3. Alongside the gold-based auction house, we will include an auction house within Diablo 3 that will allow players to trade items using real money. This auction house will be a secure and safe environment for players to trade their items over Battle.net. In the previous game, Diablo 2, we did not offer such a feature, which resulted in many players turning to unscrupulous third-party services to purchase items. We felt that because players clearly wanted such a feature, it made sense for us to build it in to Diablo 3, so they could trade in a more convenient and secure manner than going through an unauthorized third party. Players who participate in this optional system will be able to list items on the auction house for a flat fee, with another charge for completed transactions. When listing an item for sale, players will have the ability to direct the proceeds either to their e-balance, which will remain on Battle.net, or to cash out through a third party service. We have not disclosed specific fees but we plan on keeping them nominal so that more players can participate in it if they so choose, and so that players will opt to use our secure approved method of item trading and not turn to third parties. We will also allow a limited number of free listings each week so players can build up a balance without needing to deposit any funds to get started. As for the upcoming beta, Diablo 3 is still on track to go into external beta testing later this quarter. 
and we are still working hard to ship the game before the end of the year. However, we're not ready to commit to a release date at this time. What I can tell you is that the press who visited us last week played a near final version of the beta content, and the response has been overwhelmingly positive. We are very much looking forward to getting the beta into the hands of our players and collecting their feedback for the final phase of development. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to talk about BlizzCon, where we will hold exciting StarCraft II and World of Warcraft tournaments and share news about all of our franchises. Once again, this year we sold out the show in a matter of seconds. I'm also very pleased to note that this year's BlizzCon will host a finals event for the Global StarCraft League, which is growing in viewership around the world. The GSL recently announced that they have served more than 50 million videos on demand and live streams this year alone. Another prominent esports league, Major League Gaming, held a tournament in Anaheim this past weekend and served more than 30 million online streams of their esports matches over three days. The interest in all of these leagues illustrates that esports is becoming a truly global phenomenon, and it's great to see, to see StarCraft II at the center of all the activity. The rest of 2011 and beyond is looking very exciting for Blizzard. We are making great progress on Diablo III, and the StarCraft II team is hard at work on Heart of the Swarm. As always, we are continuing to make adjustments to our infrastructure to better support our massive community of players and keep pace on all the products in our pipeline. Thank you, and I'd like to turn the call back over to Kristen. Thank you, operator. I think we'll open up for questions. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please do so by pressing the star key followed by the digit 1 on your touchtone telephone. If you are using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Please limit yourself to one question. You may press star 1 again after your first question if you have a follow-up. Once again, press star 1 on your touchtone telephone to ask a question, and we'll pause a brief moment to assemble the queue. We'll first move to Brian Pitt with UBS. Great. Uh, thanks. Some questions about Elite. How should we think of uh, Elite in terms of margin uh, relative to the overall company? And can you help us understand the level of development so far that has gotten into the service, you know, and what's it going to re be required going forward to, you know, con continue to support the effort? Thanks. Well, the way we're thinking about Elite is we're approaching this as an opportunity to improve the overall Call of Duty experience and solidify Call of Duty's leadership position first and foremost. Uh, having said that, um, it does cost money to run the service. It'll cost money to uh, both technologically and from a, a customer service standpoint to, to run the service and to do some of the things at scale that we're attempting to do, which are industry first. Um, uh, and uh, we're, I don't think we're ready to talk about what it means to the company from a margin standpoint. But, you know, I'll just add one thing here. This is Thomas. Uh, obviously, it's going to be a digital product. All of our digital products come with margins that are north of 50%, and I don't think this is going to be any different. Great. And we'll move next to Brian Karmazad with Goldman Sachs. Hi there. Uh, Mike, and I know you don't tend to speak in the same superlatives as Eric does, but can you help us frame how you guys are thinking about the lifetime value of a Diablo three player versus maybe some of the other franchises or maybe some of the stuff on the publishing side? Okay. Um, well, what, what I would say is that um, Diablo three, at least in the West, is primarily going to operate off of a standard box revenue model. Um, and, you know, with the box and um, and uh, expansions to follow. Um, the auction house is really a big unknown for us. We really don't have any uh, predictions on how uh, popular it will be, although we do expect it to be a pretty integral part of the game. And we uh, also expect it to drive um, engagement and longevity in the life of Diablo III. Okay, that's helpful. And then, Thomas, I... I don't know if I, I missed it, but um, was there any change in the assumptions for the fall releases that are baked into the guidance? Uh, not really. I mean, we've raised the numbers for the year largely because of our strong performance year-to-date. We've outperformed yeah. our plan in the first as well as in the second quarter, and that's really the driver of uh, the guidance going back for the year. All right. That's helpful. Thank you. We'll move next to Arvind Bhatia with Sternagy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this question is really just trying to understand how much of the second quarter upside uh, 
came from uh, things you might have otherwise gotten in the third quarter. I think you, you hinted at uh, some shift there. Can you maybe yeah. quantify that a little bit? Yeah, it was about uh, a penny or two. A penny or two, gotcha. Just a quick follow-up on uh, Call of Duty. Uh, can you guys give us the lifetime performance of Black Ops as of this point uh, versus uh, Modern Warfare 2? Uh, life to date sales of Black Ops are approximately $25 million, and uh, that compares to Modern Warfare 2, uh, two years out of development, at um, $22 million. Great. Thank you, guys. We'll move next to Edward Williams with BMO Capital Markets. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, a couple of quick questions for you. Can you comment a little bit, Mike, on cataclysm in China? Um, what you've seen relative to what you're, uh, you know, what you're targeting coming out of it? Um, and can you also just talk a little bit about the subscriber levels? So what's what you think is driving that number? Okay. Um, well, so uh, cataclysm just launched a couple of weeks ago in China. Um, we've seen. Uh, Concurrency levels uh, increase substantially. Um, I think that there are still um, big opportunities in China um, to uh, to continue growing there, especially as we focus more on the tier two and three cities. And um, you know, uh, China represents. Um, in terms of broadband penetration, um, there are more broadband users in China than any other country in the world, and it's continuing to grow from there. So I think that that presents a huge opportunity for us in the future, um, especially as the Tier 2 and 3 uh, game rooms upgrade their systems to be able to support Warcraft, World of Warcraft. Um, in terms of subscriber growth around the world, what I would say is, um, you know, what we have seen is that uh, subscribership tends to be uh, seasonal and driven by content updates. And so as we're heading, you know, further away from an expansion launch, it's normal to see some declines. Um, we're, the team is currently working on our largest uh, um, uh, content update since Cataclysm, and that'll hit later this year. Um, we are also doing things um, to continue driving growth, like the recent um, uh, starter edition for World of Warcraft, which lowers the barrier to trial by providing the first 20 levels free. Um, we have seen an increase in, uh, in uh, new account creations from that. It's still too early to tell on, um, on conversions to subscribership, but I really believe that um, that is an important uh, direction for us to continue lowering that, that barrier to trial and reaching new players around the world. Um, we're also looking at new markets. Um, we had great success in, in uh, Russia. Um, we think that Brazil is really an uh, emerging market that has a lot of potential in terms of the number of broadband users. They're a top ten country. Um, their economy has performed uh, very well compared to the rest of the world during the recession. and. Um, you know, we already have some Brazilians playing in English, but we think the market can be a lot bigger in Portuguese. Um, you know, and I think that there are other countries we're looking at beyond that as well, but I don't have anything that I can talk about. Okay, just a, as a quick follow-up on China, if I could. How much of your penetration has, how much of, has your subscriber base in China changed with regards to Tier 2 and Tier 3 over the course of the last couple of years? How significant has that become? Yeah, I mean, that that's a an area of growth for us, but we don't break down those numbers, sorry. Okay. All right. Thank you. We'll move next to Jatil Patel with Deutsche Bank Securities. Thanks. A couple of questions, actually. First of all, on Diablo 3, Mike, if you can comment on, I guess, what's the determinant on uh, Diablo 3 coming out uh, in 2011 versus 2012. Second, uh, you've got 11.1 .1 million subs. You did about $359 million in revenue, which was uh, up nicely versus a year ago while subs are down. Can you reconcile the incremental revenue from a product sales versus value-added services standpoint and have a quick follow-up? Okay. Um, so in terms of um, the timing on the Diablo 3 release date, really it's just going to come down to, um, you know, there are a lot of moving parts in putting out a uh, complex release like Diablo 3. You know, we talked about the new auction house technology, which um, has not been uh, has not been fully tested. Um, we're not yet in beta, um, and really, it's just going to come down to uh, when the game is ready for prime time. And so, we'll know more when we hit beta, and we'll know more when we put some of these new systems into test. 
Um, it's a brand new infrastructure, um, you know, with a lot of complex moving parts. Um, in terms of the, uh, the World of Warcraft business, you know, clearly coming off of the Cataclysm launch, we, um, we had a lot of momentum coming into uh, 2011, and that has certainly helped the revenue numbers. Um, I think that, uh, let's see, yeah, I mean, you know, there's uh, the value-added services um, launching in China is certainly a factor, um, and um, yeah, I think I think that um, you know, those are probably the, the major factors driving revenue. You know, it's it's uh, we ended the year uh, slightly up compared to to last year, so we're pretty happy with the result. And uh, just I guess on uh, overall operating margins, rebit margins for Blizzard, there were I think there were 38 percent. I guess uh, anything in particular in terms of opex that uh, you spent against for Blizzard, um, or you're kind of continuing to spend against that we should be mindful of. Yeah, um, so we are increasing our investment in um, in new projects that um, that haven't necessarily been announced, um, and uh, we have increased the uh, investment in uh, customer service. But I would say I think we're at scale at this point, um, and uh, there was um, you know we did uh, we did enter beta for StarCraft II last year during the quarter which allowed us to capitalize development expenses and I think that helped us out on the OPEX side uh, on the comparison. But the, yeah, I think one thing to be mindful of GEDL is the increased investment on new products. All right. And next we have Eric Handler with MKM Partners. Thanks for taking my question. Just a couple of quick things on your on the guidance. So, am I understanding correct that the reason uh, you didn't let all six cents of the upside relative to guidance uh, or EPS flow through is because you pulled forward one to two pennies uh, from the third quarter to the second quarter, and then secondly, you had a big operating margin outperformance in the second quarter, yet you're keeping your full year operating margin guidance at 31%. Um, is there a significant increase in expenses that you have in the back half of the year as a reason why you're not in, um, taking your operating margin guidance higher? Yeah, so the, yes on the first question, uh, and that's also reflected in the fact that the, the September quarter number is probably lower than some I have expected originally. And then on the second point, you know, we are getting increasingly uh, more confident in uh, the potential of our product launches uh, in the back half. Uh, particularly um, the, the game quality we are seeing on, on Skylanders is very encouraging. The retail feedback we're getting is very encouraging. So uh, we have uh, uh, put aside some additional uh, marketing funds to support the launch of the new IP. So those two things combined uh, get you uh, still to uh, an increase in the top line uh, and EPS largely driven by the overperformance in the first half of the year. Okay, thank you. And just one quick follow-up. Um, is there any opportunity to use an auction house type of services or similar value-added services uh, for StarCraft II that you are for Diablo and World of Warcraft? Yeah, um, you know, uh, we really try to design the, uh, the features of these games to to leverage the the, uh, the needs of the games themselves, Diablo three is a, or and previous Diablo games as well were very um, item centric games with a lot of uh, item trading with without a good mechanism really for doing that. And so, um, I guess the equivalent uh, type of thing for StarCraft two would be uh, our map marketplace, where players are able to create. Um, Players are able to create their own custom maps, and we do have plans to provide a marketplace where, where they'd be able to offer them up to other players for sale. Of course, it's a very complex system that is still being designed. I think that some of the things we're doing on the back end to support the Diablo III auction house actually can be leveraged um, in StarCraft II to support that system, which is, uh, which is great. Um, on the World of Warcraft side, we really don't have plans to, uh, to uh, do something similar. It's, it's a very different game and it really um, it really isn't designed with um, this type of item trading in mind. Great. Thank you. We'll take our last question from Doug Krauts with Cohen and Company. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, you guys had north of a 20% sequential revenue increase in Asia during the quarter. Uh, I know you launched StarCraft II in China, and you also have the value-added services. I was wondering if you could kind of talk about directionally what, what, were the, what was the biggest drivers of that revenue increase. Yeah, the, the biggest drivers for that were um, the popularity of World of Warcraft, especially in, in China, um, and the launch of the value-added services. I think one of the things we're realizing, though, is that the success that we've had, which is unique for Western publishers in China, we've learned so much about the opportunity that over the next three to five years you'll continue to see investment and real opportunity for us in places like China that are not really opportunities for many of our competitors. Great. Thanks. That does conclude our question and answer session. At this time, I'll turn the call back over to our speakers for any final or additional comments. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. On behalf of everyone here at Activision Blizzard, we thank you for your time and consideration, and uh, have a great day. That does conclude our conference call for today, everyone. We thank you all for your participation.